Okay, incredible book today, The Elements by Euclid. Love it. Okay, here's the story. I took geometry in high school. Well, actually, in junior high, they gave me this math test. And um, to determine, like, where you were at and how good you were or whatever, well, apparently I scored well enough that they put me in Algebra 1. That would have been 8th grade. So I was in Algebra 1 in 8th grade, and it was fine. I could do Algebra, okay. But the way that it, the program worked was that if you took Algebra 1 in 8th grade, you had to take Honors Geometry in ninth grade at high school. Well, they're both math, but they're very different ways of thinking. And geometry is very, very spatial. And I'm not real spatial. You know, if you look at those intelligences by Gardner, Blaine's really spatial, I'm not. It's one of my lower intelligences. So geometry was going to be inherently difficult for me anyway because I'm not inherently good at geometry. I mean, at, at, at spatial relationships. So then I had to be in honors geometry. And the thing that made it even worse was that I had a teacher who was writing her own geometry textbook and somehow got permission to use it. She either used selections or that was our main text, I don't know. But I had a hard time being really um, organized. And anyway, the way she taught it and using her textbook and the combination of it being geometry and being honors and all this kind of stuff, I just bombed it. It was so hard. And I don't know if I failed it or I got a D or I did something horrible. And so I, I actually, second semester, got permission to scale back to regular geometry with a regular t textbook. And then I did okay. I don't think I did Marvel C, probably got a B or something. So now you fast forward, I don't know how many years, 15, 12, 15 years. I'm an adult. I've got these kids. I'm introduced to liberal arts. I find out that there's this great book set and there's all these books from history and there were these mathematicians in history all of this I was pretty I mean I I guess if I would have thought about it but I didn't ever really think about it and so uh, the, all of that wasn't uh, wasn't really clear to me so I you know there's 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 Archimedes and there's Nicomachus and there's all these people well there's Euclid and I think he was like he lived in like 200 AD 200, something like that. I don't know if this is going to tell me. University of Alexandria. So Euclid's this really awesome guy that is a math professor, University of Alexandria, and he wants to put together a, like a geometry class, and so he collects all the known information on geometry. And he basically writes a textbook. I had the teacher that taught me Euclid later on in adulthood the second time, said that it was basically the, it really is the most successful textbook in history because up until maybe a hundred years ago now, 80-ish years ago, it was the geometry textbook in, West, in the West, period. It was what was always used for geometry and for math. It was always one of the maths that were taught and Euclid was always the one used. And so as textbooks go, it's the most successful textbook. So he collected all this information, but then he wrote it himself. So the way that it's laid out is that he starts out with, what does he call him? Um, he, this introduction is forever long in this one. Now you're going to find this in the great book set. This is just a different translation of a, and it's in a paperback. Uh, it's got a introduction and commentary by Sir Thomas Heath. Big fat introduction. I've not read all of it, but I bet it's really great information. So this is book one. This is how Euclid starts. Definitions. A point is that which has no part. A line is breathless length. The extremities of a line are points. So he goes down and he's got 23 of these definitions. Then he has postulates and common notions. He's got five postulates and five common notions. So what he's doing is he's laying a foundation of information. He's saying, according to my definitions, my postulates and my common notions, given all that information now, we're going to begin to learn geometry, but really what's happening is that you're learning to think logically. You're learning that you have to create your foundational idea, and then you have to be able to build on that, and as you add new information, show the common sense, or not even always common sense, but the natural conclusions of those things. Sometimes they're nonsensical, sometimes they're, um, they're common sense. 
So now here I am. I'm working on a liberal arts degree. I want to learn Euclid. I want, I want to just have this experience, right? And I find out that a Euclid class is being taught near me with this awesome mentor who's been through it several times and who knows it and loves it. It was perfect timing. But I was really scared because I had had this horrible experience in geometry and I had just totally bombed and all of my, you know, fears just totally came out and I finally was like, I'm just going to have to call him and talk to him. So I called him and I was like, okay, so what's this going to be like? And am I going to be able to do it if I had this horrible experience? Basically, am I smart enough to get this? Because it seems really hard and geometry is really, really hard. And he's like, Audrey, this is, this is the best textbook ever written. It's totally logical. It's going to, you're going to get it. Now that's not to say it's a breeze and that you get it the first time because that's not true either. But what I found out was that I loved Euclid because I loved the exhilarating feeling of figuring out his propositions. So what you do is, and our teacher was brilliant, so here's my old Euclid math book from however many years ago it was. Oh, it was 05, so it was eight years ago. So this is how he told us to do it. I've got Euclid book one, definitions, and I write, a point is that which has no part. And then I wrote down, this is what I think about this. All my questions, concerns, and thoughts about that definition. So I wrote, could points be ideas? Do we just imagine them? Something that has no part must be the basic element because of the argument of holons, but there must be a starting point. There must be a beginning. The point may be anything, just a place to start. Maybe it's just representative like x or equals. So those are my thoughts about this first definition. And then I went through every definition and I wrote down all my thoughts. I did the same thing with the postulates and the common notions. And, um, and then he goes through, let's see how he does this. Um, this has tons of commentary and footnotes on it. We didn't worry about any of that. We just worried about straight Euclid, exactly what Euclid said. And I think in the great books you find it's just Euclid. So you get to um, okay. So this is still something else. So you get to proposition one. You get to the proposition, and it says on a given finite straight line to construct an equilateral triangle. That's what we're going to propose to do. I propose that we're going to draw a given finite straight line and construct an equilateral triangle. So we need to construct a triangle that we know is exactly equal on three sides. So how are we going to take our definitions and our, and our common notions and everything and, and construct that? Well, when I went through the rest of his, um, when I went through the rest of his definitions, I drew them out. So um, for example, rectilineal figures are those, this is number 19, which are contained by straight lines, trilateral figures being those contained by three quadrilateral. So you're thinking all the time, right? You're thinking these three and you're thinking, okay, this is what a trilateral is, I drew it. This is what a quadrilateral is. And I'm doing this on graphing paper so I know that I'm exactly square and straight. This is a quadrilateral, so I can just understand all these things that he's teaching. Okay, so we get to this proposition and he says, let AB be the given finite straight line. So you've got AB, and, and there'll always be a drawing. See, I don't know if you can see it. There'll always be a drawing, and then there'll be, um, oh, what do you call it? Just this description, this argument. It's a logical argument. If this is this, then this is this, and therefore this is this. And you start with one, and you go all the way through, and they build on each other. So if these are all true, then this is true, and then that makes this true, and that makes this true, and then later on you'll return to one. And if this pro if proposition 10 was true, then proposition 2 in book 2 is true, based on what we did there, and then we build on it. It is one of the great tutorials in logical, clear, streamlined, point-by-point thinking. It's a skill everybody needs to develop. Some um, are born more naturally able to think clearly and logically than others. But in an age that emphasizes emotional behavior as heavily as ours does, this is so helpful and beneficial. Um, my oldest son is leaving home and 
He did, Euclid, and I intend to have all my children work, at least on book one, to gain those skills. A story that's told about um, Lincoln, and I've read it in a couple biographies on him. He, he wanted to be a more logical thinker. He was almost entirely self-educated in classics and studied like crazy. There's this funny little story told of him when he's young that he was sitting on a fence reading a book and a man came by and looked at him and said, what are you reading? And he said, I'm not reading, I'm studying. So that's the kind of man Lincoln was. But there's a, there's a connection with Euclid. I guess he, um, he used Le Euclid to fine-tune his logical thinking skills, which made him one of the best debaters and speakers that in American history. And in many of the debates, he was able to make arguments and make points in very brilliant ways because he had trained his mind in this way. And he memorized large sections of Euclid, spent a lot of time in Euclid specifically. And uh, I think he probably enjoyed the mental exercise, but it was really fine-tuning his ability to think in this way. So it's valuable as a math book. It's valuable to just learn the basics of geometry. And I think, and I've, I've been in other, you know, I'll just buy little workbooks, there's other programs, Matthew C. They're good, they're helpful. Um, the thing that's so fun about Euclid is that you you think and you think and you and 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 you talk to someone about it, or you have a mentor, or you you look at tutorials or whatever, and when you get it, this light goes on and it's exhilarating. It's so funny. I got it, I got this hard, you know, uh, geometrical concept and and I get why it works, and that was what was so fun about it, was just the enlightenment that I experienced and uh, overcoming kind of that baggage about geometry in general, but just the fun of learning. And uh, you don't have to do all the books. Book one is, is, is really, I don't know, book one and book two is what I've done. And it was great. So it's a math book. It's a, it's a, logic and, uh, it's a, it's a logical thinking skills book. Greatest textbook ever written. And, uh, and a really fun exercise. Do one a week if you feel like it. You know, do it yourself and show your kids how fun it is, and then do it with them. And I could, I don't have any of my kids here, but I could get my son on here. It was tough, but it was, it was meaningful. You know, it's, it's, it's great to do something difficult and then, and then feel great about yourself because you did it. Anyway, that's Euclid. If you're wondering who he is and what he's about, I would recommend going through the definitions and the common notions and doing book one and you'll have a great experience. I think you'll be able to figure it out. And I recommend it doing the way my mentor taught me, get a graphing notebook and draw them out. He had us write out every word of every proposition and that really, really helped. I recommend that you do that too. And um, we, I also would skip a page and go to the next page and, and get it all written out so that my pencil wouldn't smudge. Anyway, great, great fun, a great educational tool Wait until 14, 15, 16 for the average kid before you try to introduce it and uh, go slowly, but have a great time.